Greetings and welcome to Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation. To our members, friends, and everyone joining us in our virtual congregation on YouTube today. Hello, I am the Reverend Robin Landerman Zucker, minister of this congregation, and I will be hosting our virtual worship service for today, Sunday, November 29th, 2020, with classical music selections from Rebecca Prisnick and friends, and the video of the ballad Grateful from the great Brian Stokes Mitchell. Two of our worship associates, Nancy Paxton and Mark James, will offer a rich collection of chosen and original poems that invite reflection and inspire gratitude on this Sunday after a challenging Thanksgiving. We're glad you're here. And we are glad that you have made Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation a part of this day in your spiritual life. Our congregation is spiritually open and intentionally inclusive. Whoever you are and whomever you love, you are welcome here. And we will gladly and joyfully marry you here. Our members and friends bring many viewpoints, theologies, and interests to our door. And here we trust that you will find a common desire for meaningful community and spiritual growth and for relevant religious exploration in a framework with very flexible borders. Membership in this congregation is open to anyone who chooses to walk with us in the spirit of love, the search for truth and the pursuit of justice. As I light the chalice, the symbol of our free faith, I invite you to light a chalice or candle at home and join in the response words you will see on your screen. We light this chalice with a flame that draws us together. With this flame, we cut through the darkness of isolation and are warmed by the fires of our inner connection. The mission and covenant of Beacon reflect our values, and they express our sense of ourselves as a gathered community in the world. Please join me in saying our mission and covenant. You will see the words on your screen. The mission of Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation is to be a welcoming community that embraces diverse thought and belief and builds a just, peaceful, and compassionate world. Love is the spirit of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in kindness, thus do we covenant. And now to set the mood for our service of poetry and music today, we'll start with this poem by Wendell Berry entitled, How to Be a Poet to remind myself. One, make a place to sit down, sit down, be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have. Inspiration, work, growing older, patience. For patience joins time to eternity. Any readers who like your poems, doubt their judgments. Two, breathe with unconditional breath, the unconditional air. Shun electric wire, communicate slowly, live a three-dimensional life. Stay away from screens, stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Three, accept what comes from silence. Make the best of it you can. Of the little words that come out of the silence, like prayers, pray back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. The first poem is by Manish Misra Mazaretti, 
called Harvest Time. Let us ground ourselves in this season, ground ourselves in this time and space. Winter is near upon us. Our task before it is the harvest. Seeds have yielded all manner of fruit, all manner of consequences. We enter the sacred space, bringing our whole selves, the parts we like and the parts we do not. We come together, each with our own harvest, seeking here a word of comfort, an experience of beauty and inspiration to guide us. Let us ground ourselves in that purpose, ground ourselves in body and soul. Winter is near upon us. Sunlight gives way to night. Coldness grows closer. Gathering together, we seek warmth in one another's company. We seek the eternal light that permeates all. Whatever your harvest, whatever your pain or joy, you are welcome here and will be held. Let the warmth flow to you and through you. Feel the healing strength of this community. Know that here you are not alone, that you have found companions for the journey, grounded in that spirit, grounded in the spirit of thanksgiving. Come, let us worship. The first section is, what are you thankful for this year? Um, and the inspiration comes from Melissa Kirsch, who writes, this year expressing gratitude seems more essential than ever. It's been difficult lately not to focus on what we're missing, the people we're not seeing, the places we're not going, the things we're not doing. Articulating what we're grateful for is a radical act in the midst of a hard time turning our attention to the things we do have rather than what we don't is a tough task, but a crucial one. Next is a poem by Bonnie Shaw called The Before Times. Before we were living in a pandemic, we went to lunch with our friends in restaurants and slurped soup with crackers recrushed with our bare hands, our ordinary fingers did not ignite terror that were not vectors of disease. Before the days of self-isolation, shopping was just another chore, sometimes a pleasure, a stroll through Costco's, sampling from little paper cups, protein bars, chocolate candies, popcorn, potato chips, strolling and sampling and buying big bags of broccoli and spinach and Asian cashew salad and giant containers of gourmet cheese and yes, toilet paper. The before times have receded deep into memory as if all of that happened 10, no, 20 years ago when we lived in another land of freedom and movement and laughter and hugging and sitting in each other's company, living, alive, chatting for hours without measuring the social distance, without wearing N95 surgical masks or nitrolined gloves, without anxious fear. Now we are living in another land, frightened and confused, our minds always tasked with remembering to wash our hands, not touch our faces, not touch packages or mail without gloves and Clorox wipes, and yes, remembering to worry, as if anxious worry could create a high wall surrounded by a moat of reeking and fuming disinfectant to keep us safe in this new land of contamination and fever and suffocation and death. We must not forget the before times when we could touch doorknobs, doorbells, the mail, UPS packages, restaurant tabletops, colleagues' keyboards, and other people's hands, our own faces, 
We must not forget dinner parties, book groups, political rallies, concerts, movies, worship services, protests, weddings, funerals. In the before times, we shared our joys and sorrows together. Before I begin, I just wanted to share some of my thoughts on uh, the creation of poems. And I had the notion that poems are very much like our children. They come from us, but they seem to go beyond us and are surprising to us. Uh, they, they provoke an element that comes through us, but uh, we would not have anticipated when we see them in their full form, fully grown, uh, finished perhaps, and ready to enter the world. Um, I've, I've noticed that the poems that I write seem actually never to be fully finished because every time I go back, I am um, sensitive to maybe a, a way of writing them, writing them that might be improved. So I'm actually always editing my poems. This first poem is called An Exquisite Idea and was written uh, in May. Bones of dinosaurs create stories and stir imaginations of those crouching figures gazing into night fires, later lounging by TVs, now lost in luminescent screens. We mourn those missing beasts and trilobites of long ago, but instead we would rather be like the horseshoe crab, so prehistoric and still present, or the ginkgo tree, so persistent, or like the universal eye of God, everlasting. That would be just long enough. It's hard letting go. It's hard being such an exquis exquisite idea with eyes that see our aging image, both fantastic and frightening, reflected in this vulnerable planet home. We continue on a ticking timeline in this ever evolving beauty. This next poem is called Clarity in the Fog. And this will perhaps uh, have more pertinence to those people of my general age and older. Clarity in the Fog. The emotional heights and depths seem to expand with age while memories and names remain just out of reach. Floating, moving like a floater in my eye, teasing capture, then darting to memory's margins. So I recite the ABCs again, hoping to catch a clue for recall and reassurance. I mourn the losses, but appreciate a wisdom gained and a reception renewed to subtle beauty all around. On a solitary walk in the woods, accompanied or unaccompanied by words or people. I appreciate this emerging clarity in the fog, uncluttered by endless things to know, by the computer's applications and aggravations, other things simply forgotten often gratefully, if not gracefully. So buoyed up, I settled down to explore the untrammeled regions of my mind, guided by the quiet centrifugal drift that moves unnoticed until arriving at its end. This set of poems is about what we're calling redeeming moments. 
Celia Knapp, Young People's London Poet Laureate, writes, Poetry is the language of dreams, where anything is possible. There's no wrong answer. You can float in a poem or fly. You can bring back the dead. You can put out your hand and something will appear inside it just because you say so. You can transmit that feeling you've had, which you've not quite been able to understand before. A po writing a poem feels like grasping toward truth, a process of wonder and discovery. These next two poems suggest, at least for me, how dreaming and imagining a better future after COVID, after this terrible bruising, devising, divisive election, when we can all be together again in person, face to face. First poem is called Miracles by Gianna Branchi. There are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamed of in your philosophy. Like what? Like miracles, like changes of power, like changes in climate, like political climates collapsing, like polar ice caps, like the dungeon becoming the crown and the crown the dungeon, like not paying attention to bullies, like superpowers running out of fuel, like finding oil in the dungeon of liberty, like the dungeons of liberty becoming a gold mine, like useless poets changing the way the world thinks and sings, like a voice coming out of the dungeon, a useless voice that has something to say but doesn't know how to market it, like finding yourself for the first time happy even though you're in prison, like finding camaraderie and solidarity among friends you never thought could be your friends, like understanding the other, not loving the other, but putting yourself in the shoes of the other, not to take their position, not to steal what the other has, but to feel what the other feels, to appreciate his thoughts, not to be ironic, clever, smart, but to be profound, not to be the boss who puts everybody down, but to be the leader of a chorus of voices, each and every single one of them having their own point of view, like saying, stop being a predicate and become. The second poem is by Joshua Bennett. It's called Dad Poem. Months into this plague now, I'm disallowed entry, even into the waiting room with mom, escorted outside instead by men armed with guns and bottles of hand sanitizer, their entire countenance its own American metaphor. So the first time I see you in full force, I am pacing manically up and down the block outside, FaceTiming the radiologist and your mother too, her arm angled like a cellist to help me see. We are dazzled by the sight of each bone in your foot, the pulsing black arch archipelago of your heart, your fists in front of your face, like mine, when I was only just born, 10 times as big as you are now. Your great grandmother calls me Tyson the moment she sees this pose, prefigures a boy built for conflict, her barbarous and metal little man. She leaves the world only months after we learn you are entering into it. The dementia's final days she envisions herself as a girl of 17, running through fields of strawberries, unfettered as a kingfisher. I watch your stance and imagine her laughter echoing back across the ages. You, her youngest descendant, born into freedom, our littlest burden lifter, world beater, avant-garde percussionist, swinging darkness, 
into song. This next poem <clears throat> was written, I, I, I would have to name it as sort of a, a poetry slam type poem. It's, it's more about rhythm and uh, spontaneity than it is about a really uh, crafted poem. Finding the rhythm. It started with the breath of effort, of motion, of finding the rhythm of footfall on solid ground. With the relentless beat, my senses were cast into the interface of earth, chill air, and early light. The light that penetrates tall pines to cast mesmerizing shadows. These long sh tree shadows pointed the way forward. And it felt like all directions were possible. All directions were forward. And the guide was the music in my ears. Yes, in my earbuds. This was not a travesty. This was my muse, the music, the lyrics. I want to celebrate the lyrics and the wail, the painful, gut-wrenching, ecstatic sound of saxophone with or without words telling a story that synchronizes with the orchestra of motion, of arms carrying me forward, ac accompanied by legs and lungs and heartbeat, finding that space in the effortless motion that is unique, that has no future and no past, that is perfect and can feel infinite. And yet, I know how rare this moment is. I am carried forward and carried back to my fundamental self, who was loved by my mother and strengthened by the tension of that love, who was encouraged to seek the unknown so that I could pull free from my youth and understand the joy of carrying love with me into my seeking. That gift that was planted could only break ground by seeking new earth to grow it. Even now, I run to find my place. Now, I create an offering of my heart and lungs to Mother Earth. I am running on her. I am lifted by her. I see her bones beneath my feet. They keep me grounded even as I move forward, even while realizing the earth is moving with me so that I am stilled inside. I am balanced even as I fall forward, creating a movement that makes a mockery of fear that celebrates life while heading towards death and embracing both fully and with joy. The next poem is a poem from Rumi, the mystical poet of, I believe, uh, uh, Persia. Um, and some words from Parker Palmer, who is known, I would think, by many Unitarians, uh, states that uh, Rumi's poetry often helps me regain perspective on life. In this poem, I love his notion that being human is like being a guest house. Unexpected visitors occasionally show up and stay for a while, including some you'd really like to throw out. Welcoming them and learning what they may have to teach you or where they may lead you isn't always easy. But in my experience, it always pays off. If for no other reason, then it hastens the day of their departure. So here we go. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing. 
and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent before, or has been sent as a guide from beyond. Now is the time in our service when friends and members are invited to share personal joy or sorrow in the supportive fellowship of this community. We also share joys and sorrows during our post-service gathering Sundays at 10 a.m. on Zoom. And if you'd like to join us, the links for that can be found in our e-news. You can sign up for the e-news on our website, beaconuu.com. Some Sundays we have a watch party at 10 a.m. You can also find those links in the e-news when we pause during the recorded service to join live for Joys and Sorrows and some connection. We hope you'll consider joining us for a watch party when we have those on Sunday. And we will be having one on Christmas Eve as well. So Joys and Sorrows. Well, we have stones that we drop into water, symbolizing that the ripples they make are symbolic of the way our lives ripple into one in, into each other's lives in joy and sorrow. So the first one is for all of us who have gone through a strange and different Thanksgiving for many of us, eating alone or maybe just with one other person because of the pandemic. And this is something that we've really been courageous enough to face. And this is a stone for all of us that we will feel connected and that we will endure and that we'll find gratitude and blessings in small things. This is a stone for all of the families that are separated this Thanksgiving, particularly college kids and other children who are separated from their families because of the pandemic and for other reasons, and also for the families that are separated at the border and are separated by refugee and other crises around the world. This stone is for you. For all of us in America who seem to be emerging on the other side of this election season with a sense of hope and uh, relief, the stone is for us that we can find a way to be unified and come together for the sake of this country. For our congregants, one in particular who has many family members who have been struck with COVID, we hold you in love and light and healing. And for all the joys and sorrows that remain unspoken because they are either too tender or too private to share, let us remember that everyone is fighting their own private battle. We know not what it is, but because we're human, we know it to be true. So let us be kind, compassionate, flexible, and forgiving with one another. Now I invite you to come into a time of some intentional breathing with me to put your feet on the floor and uncross your arms and close your eyes, put down whatever you might be holding and just breathe. Breathe in four beats slowly through your nose, five or six beats slowly out through your mouth, creating spaciousness from the crown of your head all the way down to the soles of your feet that are rooted to the ground. Just see what it feels like to breathe, really breathe. Stop and feel, breathe, and allow. As you continue to breathe, I offer this poem by Adam Zagajewski. Try to praise the mutilated world. Try to praise the mutilated world. 
Remember June's long days and wild strawberries, drops of rosé wine, the nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watched the stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it, while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees going nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music blared. You gathered acorns in the park in autumn and leaves eddied over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world and the gray feather and thrush lost at the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. Let us be silent together as we breathe and then continue our meditative breathing through the song. For the great gray sea and the bright shining sun, for the wind and the rain and enough air for everyone, We've got to give thanks for all these blessings. Got to give thanks for all these blessings. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. For the green grass in spring and the brown leaves and fall for the winter's branches bare and the summers we grown up tall we've got to give thanks for all these blessings got to give thanks for all these blessings uh -huh. Eyes that can see and lungs that can breathe, for bones that hold us tall and a heart that can beat. We've got to give thanks for all these blessings. Got to give thanks for all these blessings. Uh -huh. For patience and kindness and the courage to take wise action and even the pain that leads to letting go and understanding and compassion we've got to give thanks for all these blessings got to give thanks for all these blessings uh -huh. As Mark and I were preparing this service and he was sharing his poems with me, I often felt what William Wordsworth described so beautifully in an excerpt from one of a longer poem of his called Lines Composed a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey. I've always loved this passage, describing that serene and blessed mood in which affections lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame, and even the motion of our human blood 
almost suspended. We are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While with the eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. Rather than reading all of Wordsworth's long poem, I thought I'd just read another poem that's probably more familiar to you by Wendell Berry called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. This next poem uh, had its origins about two and a half years ago as I was driving out of town uh, at dusk on 89 uh, toward the Grand Canyon. And I recorded my thoughts and observations on my cell phone. And so I, I'm just passing this on as a technique of being able to capture little tidbits of ideas that may blossom into a poem. Uh, put an app on your phone where you can record yourself and you just uh, say whatever uh, little uh, image you have to share. And then you could capture quite often what I do is I'll end up capturing like four or five of those in close sequence. And then I'll kind of put them together and see what kind of poem emerges. So this is uh, taken from some uh, recordings from a couple of years ago. And this has connections to the Black Lives Matter issue. O Black Raven. O Black Raven clinging to the fence wire in the broad, windy barrens. Light fades to dusk as I see your beak like a blade slicing into the wind, feathers rippling behind. I motor by in my metal cocoon, unconscious of the comfort afforded me by white lines on black asphalt. I strain to see you more clearly, but this only enhances the aura around you, alerting a discomfort, a caution that percolates inside. Then a distant memory materializes from my past. While running on an unfamiliar trail, I abruptly halt in mid stride to peer just ahead through sweat stinging eyes. First, I see a curved branch lying across my path, inanimate, unthreatening. Then realize it is a copperhead snake, suddenly alive, un yet unmoving, frozen by fright, poised to flee, willing to defend. A small stone within reach offers itself, a weapon preferred to a simple leap over when gripped with fear. My throw misses, so the more reasonable snake simply, quickly, slithers into the cover of tall grass, seeking safe shelter from the ma madness of the partially blind. Meanwhile, I'm once again behind the wheel, hurtling onward, the large bird now in the rear view becoming shivering shreds of a black plastic bag caught on the fence, flailing, flightless, almost comical in the wind-blown field, once threatening, now unreal. I saw you struggling to free yourself from my clouded eyes, O oh, illusory bird. But you were anchored to the fence by the wire barbs of unseen prejudice. 
My reflection appears in the rear view mirror, the eyes of distorted per perception, better seen now in hindsight. Open your wings now, raven of my imagining. Embrace the shifting winds that are stirring around us. Show how you can fly. I want to see you fly. Take to the air and explore the heights that call to you, that welcome you back home so that we may both be free. The spirit of generosity and gratitude flows through Beacon. Whether we are here in our building on North LaRue Street or we are here in our virtual sanctuary on YouTube, we take an offering each week to support Beacon and its programs. There are two ways for you to make a donation. One is to go to our website, beaconuu.com, and find the donate button and make a secure online donation through the Vanco application. We ask that you use your bank account rather than a debit card so that we can save some fees and have more to support us, particularly during this time. Or you could send us a check to our Flagstaff address, 510 North LaRue Street, Flagstaff, Arizona, 86001. Either way, we are so grateful for your support during this challenging time. And finally, at the end of our service, we come together, we hold hands, and we feel the warmth and power of this community. While we've been apart during the pandemic, we continue this ritual, imagining ourselves together, holding hands in just that way, feeling that warmth and feeling that power. Because whether we are here together virtually or here together physically, we are beacon, always connected, stay safe and well. Blessed be, blessed we, and amen. We'll hear some closing poems now from Nancy and Mark. The last poem I'd like to read to give you some final thoughts and I hope some hope is by Ellen Bass called Pray for Peace. Pray to whomever you kneel down to, Jesus nailed to his wooden or plastic cross, his suffering face bent to kiss you, Buddha still under the bow tree in scorching heat, Adonai, Allah, raise your arms to Mary that she may lay her palm on your brows. Or Shekena, queen of heaven and earth, or Yana in her stripped descent. Then pray to the bus driver who takes you to work on the bus. Pray for everyone riding that bus, for everyone riding buses all over the world. Drop some silver and pray. Waiting in line for the movies, for the ATM, for your latte and croissant, offer your plea. Make your eating and drinking a supplication. Make your slicing of carrots a holy act. Each translucent layer of the onion a deeper prayer. To hawk or wolf or the great whale, pray. Bow down to terriers and shepherds and Siamese cats, fields of artichokes and elegant strawberries. Make the brushing of your hair a prayer, every strand its own voice, singing in the choir on your head. As you wash your face, the water slipping through your fingers, a prayer. Water, the softest thing on earth, gentleness that wears away rock. Making love, of course, is already a prayer, skin and open mouths worshiping that skin the fragile cases we are poured into. If you're hungry, pray. If you're tired, pray to Gandhi and Dorothy Day, Shakespeare, Sappho, Sojourner Truth. 
When you walk to your car, to the mailbox, to the video store, let each step be a prayer that we all keep our legs, that we do not blow off anyone else's legs or crush their skulls. And if you are riding on a bicycle or a skateboard in a wheelchair, each revolution of the wheels a prayer as the earth revolves. Less harm, less harm, less harm. And as you work typing with a new manicure, a tiny palm tree painted on one pearlescent nail, or delivering soda, or drawing good blood into rubber-capped vials, twirling pizzas with each breath in, take in the faith of those who have believed when belief seemed foolish, who persevered with each breath out, cherish. Pull weeds for peace, turn over in your sleep for peace. Feed the birds each shiny seed that spills onto the earth another second of peace. Wash your dishes, call your mother, drink wine. Shovel leaves or snow or trash from your sidewalk. Make a path, fold a photo of a dead child around your visa card. Scoop your holy water from the gutter. Gnaw your crust. Mumble along like a crazy person, stumbling your prayer through the streets. My final poem, this is from David White, W-H-Y-T-E, uh, record a written in 2013. Everything is waiting for you. Your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone, as if life were a progressive and cunning crime with no witness to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely even you at times have felt the grand array, the swelling presence and the chorus crowding out your solo voice. You must note the way the soap dish enables you or the window latch grants you freedom. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentors of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you. And the tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything is waiting for you.